Welcome back. You're listening to the panel discussion, A Holistic Approach to Reopening Agency Offices, sponsored by Force 3 on Federal News Network. We're doing something a little different today. We're talking with the folks from the Homeland Security Department and Force 3. So let's start with the folks from the Homeland Security Department. Angela Bailey is the Chief Human Capital Officer. Karen Evans is the Chief Information Officer. Tom Chalecki is the Chief Readiness Support Officer. And Rich McComb is the Chief Security Officer, all from the Homeland Security Department. We're also joined by Eric Stahl, the Director of Networking and Security at Force 3, and Joe Lazaro, the Collaboration Practice Manager, also at Force 3. And I'm Jason Miller. So today, again, the focus on the Homeland Security Department and bringing employees safely back to the office when, when appropriate, when ready. In that first segment, Karen, let me start with you about the technology side. We heard a lot of changes to the infrastructure. We heard how you had to really use a, the partnership in many ways across the CXO community to ensure that the technology infrastructure is supporting their needs, but at the same time, you also had to worry about the technology, make sure it was, it was up to par. So walk me through some of the things you're seeing over the last four, five, six months and how the infrastructure has seen such a huge increase in, in almost every, every bit, and, bit and bite that comes through. Well, in changing, and, and I appreciate that question because it's not just across with uh, the lines of business that you're at headquarters, but this is also a partnership all the way down through the components and other CIOs within the department as a whole. So, for example, when we had to change to this environment, uh, ICE brought up 15,000 remote users in less than three days in order to be able to adapt to this changing work. Uh, place. So what we're seeing because of the cloud implementation, because of the activities that have happened in modernization, for example, the virtual desktop that we're all using now, we're seeing a 255% increase. We've actually looked at some of the statistics and looking in the last 30 days, we have over 438% use of um, teams of the virtual desktop and what we see on a daily basis is the collaboration tools that we're using. We've added new functions in there. As people are using these tools, it's highlighting more and more issues associated with making sure that we're dealing with the rules that are in the government that were a little bit easier when you were in the workplace. Now we're in the virtual environment. We've been adapting these tools. And so over 59% of our users are active in what is Teams, which is um, the Office 365 tool that we've moved out so that we can then collaborate across uh, headquarters, but also down into the components and then out to our users, and that our frontline people have the ability to collaborate among themselves when they're out doing the mission of the department. And it's not just about the technology and the use of teams, but people are actually using this for, for, to, to meet their goals uh, from a mission side, but also for other sides. Uh, Angie, jump in here a little bit and talk a little bit about the training piece, because that's also seen a huge increase. Sure. Yeah, it really has. And so one of the things that we're noticing is like our training. Well, first of all, we took a lot of the in-house training that was brick and mortar and turned it into, vir into a virtual um, way of delivering our, our training. And so what we're finding is like we've had like a 300% increase, for example, I think it was in our Stronger Bonds, which is our communications training that we did for couples. Um, and now that that's gone virtual, what's really kind of neat about that is that people are actually finding an opportunity to use it and they're craving it. And so one of the things that we've done is we've been really careful to, to allow the opportunity for not only for the employee to get the training or to hear about benefits and, and such, but it also now has opened up the opportunity because so many uh, partners and spouses and things are at home, family members are at home. It actually allows us now to reach an audience that in the past we weren't able to reach. And so we're finding huge benefits from a training standpoint uh, in this new environment. Hey, Jason, this is Tom. I want to jump in here uh, and, and, and talk about what Angie and, and uh, Karen are just saying. So this isn't actually a new thing for DHS. I mean, so we've, we've looked at our portfolio with the National Capital Region over the past year and, and using PIV card data and, and logical access data, we can look at who's coming into our buildings pre-COVID. And we were finding on average, our buildings were 50 to 60% occupied on any given day. That's not Fridays and Mondays, that's any given day over a long span of time. And that actually is consistent with information that, that GSA and in fact, some other agencies are saying. So we have been doing telework for a while. I mean, shout out to our CIO. They've supported this for quite a while. Now we haven't done it to the magnitude that we're doing it right now, 
Uh, and obviously our frontline folks out on the out on the border and at the airports aren't doing as much of this. But generally in the office spaces, this isn't really a new thing for DHS. So I think it's really just adapting and maybe expanding on some of our past practices. Over. This is Eric Stoll. Tom, just to, to, to reiterate, I think that you're right. A lot of the agencies have had some amount, some part of a virtualized workforce, but I'm sure as Karen noticed, there's been a huge uptick in that consumption. And that puts a lot of strain on resources that may not have been scaled originally for those types of capacities. So how do we adapt that now? How do we right size those utilities and those resources, not just for today, but for what we foresee for the, the near term uh, future workforce? Also, how can we ensure that we're using the right kinds of resources to secure people? So Karen mentioned specifically government regulations like CDM that protect us when we're in the office. How can we adapt that to the virtualized space? Are we leveraging things like the TIC 3.0 infrastructure and ways to secure those remote workers? Were we already implementing those? How far along that journey are we? And what can we do to speed that up or maybe bring forward some of those investments we are planning on making to make sure we're getting the biggest bang for our buck? Karen, jump in here because I want you to react to something that maybe Eric said a little bit, which is how do you ensure that you have the right size of, of the capabilities and networks for today, but also for tomorrow and going into the future? And I know you're, as you said, you came to DHS just in June, but I imagine you talked to others within the CIO office and they hopefully did some sort of stress test on the network to figure out, okay, if we go from 40% teleworking or 50% teleworking to 80% teleworking, how do we ensure that the network can handle it? Walk me through some of those ways that you, you were ensure you guys were prepared. So I appreciate the question and, and I'll, um, I'll tag on a couple of these responses, but first and foremost, based on the work that Tom had talked about. So a lot of this work with the build out of St. Elizabeth's uh, Department of Homeland Security was already planning for the future. So when you start looking at what, what was network modernization or how to be able to scale and move to the cloud, those improvements were already in the pipeline. The, I, I would have to say when you said when I came on board and I talked to the team, um, there are a lot of battle scars associated with that move and the build out. And you can see, Tom, those and and really how that worked. And because that was planned for and done correctly, um, the, the ability to scale when, when this hit uh, was second nature. Like it was everything that um, based on my past experience that you had hoped would happen with a network modernization was actually implemented at Department of Homeland Security so that scaling could happen, that plus up could happen, that the workforce could transition, uh, the CIO shop met those requirements. Now, some of the challenges that Eric brought up was, okay, we had designs and we had plans in place that we were gonna execute because we were physically here, They've had to change that and work with the contractors and the partners um, to be able to change, okay, what redesign efforts do we have to look at in order to accelerate CDM implementation? What redesign efforts, if any, do we have to look at because of the mixture of what we have planned for TIC 3.0 and how, how that's working? But as Thomas said, uh, Department of Homeland Security was planning for the future. They, they had a lot of plans in place. What ended up happening was those modernization efforts ended up being accelerated to be able to accommodate. So Office 365, just a little, here's something that's just really very simple. It has a chat function that allows people to talk during meetings. It raised a whole series of policy issues associated with what happens to the chat. Then if we have attorneys on there, what are the right pre, uh, policies? What are the types of things do we have to adapt? And the CIO shop worked with the other CXOs and general counsel office. And so when I came on board, it was very robust. You could see a bunch of different things that were already happening with the, the chat. And they had already gotten over the hurdles of what those policy issues are. So it's uh, a lot of the plans um, were accelerated and are adapted because they were planning for the future in the first place. I can only imagine what the attorney said when they jumped on and said, wait a minute, is what I'm saying here going to be a federal record? And how long does it have to last for? And who's exactly. going to capture it? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's, and so those we, issues were addressed very rapidly. It, that's exactly what the discussions were. So you're right. There was a lot of back briefing. There was a lot that came on board, but um, it really was taking advantage of the plants and accelerating them. 
it sounded like DHS was in a unique position in, in that even before the pandemic hit, probably had a very strong telework policy working from home and had had these tools generally aligned um, and using O365 as a service, right, enables you to scale up really, really quickly. But but there's also a component of, of, of also scaling down, right? So you're not over investing in technology that when you don't need it anymore, it's just on that on that shelf. So I think I think a lot of agencies that, that we work with went into the pandemic not having these you know, functionalities, these capabilities. So they're having to procure this in a time where they're, you know, getting things through acquisition. There was, you know, uh, supply chain it issues, getting hardware, um, people issues, getting this um, installed and, and implemented. So that as a service delivery model, especially for collaboration, uh, you know, probably really enabled DHS to kind of scale and, and just kind of blast this forward um, at a, at a at a at a rate that in the traditional model really wouldn't even be possible. But before Angie jumps in, Joe, let me just do a quick follow up for you. One of the things that you bring up is the ability not just to scale up, but to know when and how to scale down. Is that a conversation that you're seeing agencies starting to have as either people come back to the office? Because I think we'll get into it in a second about this hybrid environment, and then we can also bring some others into the discussion. But but are you starting to see that conversation happen? Of okay, what does scaling down look like and how much should we scale down? 5%, 10%, or, or is it more like the utility model where you can just plug in and, and unplug as, as needed? I think it's really the latter and it isn't a collaboration. I mean, it, it's the shift from buying perpetual software to re renting software, right? I, I don't wanna own software, I wanna subscribe to it. I wanna use the features and functions that are applicable to me. And I have this requirement today Tomorrow I may have an extra 25%. After that, I, I may may go down 10. So I think it's it's an industry shift to the subscription model across all things technology. And, and I and I and I think we're seeing the, the fruits of, of that model here. When we talk about telework or we talk about the use of all this technology and the tools and stuff that we're that we're using, it's what's interesting though is that telework in the past, yes, we were very good at this and we've, and DHS has clearly knocked it out of the park when it comes to the equipment and, and our ability to tap into the networks and all those kinds of things. What we didn't anticipate though, and what we didn't plan for was the fact that you might have a five-year-old standing behind you yelling at you that they need their princess dress zipped up, right? And so the distraction for the employees is like, is something that, that I think in the past Teleworks never had to deal with. Um, the other thing is, is like these standard tours of duty, right? So yeah, we Teleworked, but we Teleworked on our normal tour of duty, whereas now what we have is employees, and oh, by the way, this will clear up to the executives as well because, you know, they have family dynamics as well, but asking for things like, hey, can I start work at 10 o'clock, which means that core hours are now impacted, right? And so what we're finding is we're having to look at all of our policies because it's not just about the technology, it's about how are our employees going to work? When can our employees work? Do we go to like, you know, a 24 seven operation because, hey, that's really the only time that I'm able to jump on and get my work done is between midnight and 7 a.m. because, you know, my husband's home then and he can take, and the kids are in bed. And so now I can process that HR action that I would have processed before between eight and 4.30. And so it's really a combination of, I think what the technology has done and our ability to be spot on is first of all, it's taken, taken away that excuse, right? For why we can't get the work done. Um, but, and it's done it in a remarkable way. But what we're now faced with is the stresses of being on 24 seven almost. And so that's what I'm trying to, and the HR community is really trying to balance and then working with my colleagues, we're really starting to have conversations around how do we meet the needs of our employees where they're at in their personal situation and still get the mission of DHS done at the same time. Rich, let me ask you to jump in because you've been quiet sure. the whole segment here. Uh, this also puts a different burden on them from a security perspective because if somebody wants to come to the office at midnight, can you support them as an example? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jason. I appreciate that. I was going to about to jump in. So a couple of things. I'll get to that on the technology piece. Just kind of to, to hit upon that again. Uh, you know, taking uh, 
taking technology as an enabler, and then also kind of uh, getting to the part of being able to monitor folks uh, using that technology. So on the first part, uh, from a personal security perspective, our folks who vet people who come into this department, uh, who vet all of our uh, employees and contract staff, uh, have been able to do that virtually uh, for a long time. The vast majority of our personal security specialists have been uh, able to do that in a remote environment uh, with a secure network uh, that uh, gives them access to all of the uh, the appropriate records and PI and everything they need to do that. So that's been the enabler, will continue to be the enabler, and I think that, that we'll see probably an increased uh, amount of telework in that environment. On the flip side of that, uh, you know, uh, we've got more people in the telework environment beyond uh, the things that uh, Karen's folks do from uh, monitoring the networks. Obviously, uh, in my role, I have the Insider Threat Program. So uh, we as a department uh, in coordinate, obviously uh, with the help of CIO and, and lots of other folks have moved out pretty smartly uh, in expanding our Insider Threat Program monitoring capability beyond the classified networks into the a sense of an unclassified network. So that gives us, that's an important insight. Some of the things that Angie alluded to with regard to um, uh, people in stress, uh, we can perhaps uh, avert or see where there may be some issues with uh, potential for uh, violence or, or other concerns that we can then relay to uh, the appropriate uh, uh, managers and uh, employee uh, specialists that help people out and kind of get ahead of that power curve. So. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, allows us to monitor but enable at the same time. Uh, to your question about folks coming in, uh, absolutely access control systems are, are there and allow them to come in. Uh, we have found from our perspective, we're able to do about uh, 85 to 90 percent of our roles and responsibilities as a security element for the headquarters here. But that other 15 percent requires people to be in a classified space. So those are the ones who have been here uh, on a regular basis. Uh, you know, uh, working with our uh, partners in FPS and all that who are really 24-7, they're able to monitor the spaces, make sure we don't have somebody who's trying to exploit the fact that we have fewer employees in the space uh, or fewer employees in the vicinity, uh, you know, take advantage of that. So uh, uh, that's also our CCTV technology that allows us to do that in those locations where, where we have that. So Jason, the one thing that I think, and I and I know my other CXOs would probably want to jump in here, is uh, the actual plans that we've had to put in place for headquarters. Uh, there's a framework and there's guidance on this about how we have to take certain things into consideration in order to be able to open up the workplace, right? So we've been talking a lot about how we've been able to continue to do the things that we're doing um, because of network modernization, because of cloud, because of Office 365. But the other part of balancing this is, is how, how do we bring people back to work? Uh, and Angie's team has really given us a lot of tools to be able to go forward. So I know each of us, and I'm, I'm opening it, it up to my other CXOs, uh, it is about the workplace itself and how we have to look at the guidance overall says, hey, look at what the environment is and follow the local government. But when you look at headquarters workforce, our local government spans really pretty broadly. It's the state of Virginia, the state of Maryland, the District of Columbia. And we have people who commute much farther out like myself that's in the state of West Virginia, right? And so we've really had to develop those work plans, taking into consideration everything else that everybody's talking about. And so I'm gonna throw it back to Angie and some of the other CXOs, because I know I really relied on them in order for me to put together what my workplace uh, return to work plan looks like for the CIO shop. But before they do that, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back and we, when we have uh, the next segment, we can get into that a little bit. You're listening to the panel discussion, A Holistic Approach to Reopening Agency Offices, sponsored by Force 3 on Federal News Network. <laughs> 